church, let's celebrate the faithfulness of our God in your life. Has he been faithful? Is he good? Do you know who I'm talking about today? His name is Jesus. He's the same today as he was yesterday, as he's going to be tomorrow. Everything else is going to change in our life, but he remains the same. Do you believe that to be true? Do you believe that to be true? I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know if you believe it to be true. I don't know if we can go forward in this worship experience if we can't believe that to be true. So, Lord Jesus, we want to encounter you today in all your glory. Lord, we want to just pause this, pause this life and the chaos surrounding Refocus our attention on you. Humble ourselves before you. Be changed by you. Lord, you know every need in this place. So Lord, would you would you meet us right where we're at today and lead us to become fully devoted followers of you. Lord, Lead us away from, from our past and lead us closer to our future. So speak today. In the name of Jesus, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, welcome home, church. Take your seats. So glad. You're, you're here today to gather for worship. I want to invite you to, to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews in the New Testament. This is our summer teaching series. We're on uh, uh, the, the home stretch. Uh, next week we close out. Next week we close out the, the series. And so uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 31 today. One, one verse, and it's, it's, this verse is, is focusing in on Rahab, on Rahab. But, but before we dive into Hebrews 11, verse 31, just kind of want to uh, uh, sum up where we've been, and, uh, and then we're going to look at verse 31, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. Uh, the first character that we looked at, for those that don't know, Hebrews 11 is really this, this uh, uh, hall of fame of faith, if you will, people have said it to be, but it's example after example uh, of men and women that had a great faith in the Lord, right? Had great faith and lived lived lives by faith. And, and, and so we kicked off with, with Abel, with Abel. Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. Cain, his brother, brought an unacceptable sacrifice to the Lord, filled with bitterness that grew into anger. Has anyone ever been there to the to the point where, where it's growing inside of you? Something's growing and you know it's not quite right. And, and, and anger controlled Cain, Scripture tells us. And what does he do? He, he murders his brother. He murders his brother. Abel, we don't find one word spoken in, in, in this, the, the account in Genesis. But it was that by faith that he brought an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, then we looked at Enoch. Enoch didn't experience death. How crazy that would, would that be, right? How crazy w- would that be? Especially the, the grieving, pro- all that happens and goes along in the buildup. But there was this favor. And, and, and so we see that Enoch, Enoch did not experience death. It was by faith. Noah, Noah built an ark by faith. I mean, could you just imagine being Noah, the Lord uh, 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 instructing you to go build this massive boat when everyone else, I, I, you know, I, we weren't there. But am I the only one that just assumes like some things or certain things that as I'm looking at scripture, I'm like, if I was there, man, and the Lord instructed me and everyone's watching me, could you just imagine what people would be saying and thinking, why are you building this massive boat? And then you tell them it's because the Lord told you to do something. Uh, maybe you're living in that moment where you're doing something the Lord has told you to do something. I hope you're in that moment. And people are saying, why are you doing that? And all you can do is point back to the glory of God. Well, that takes us to Noah, right? By faith, he built an ark. He built this massive, this massive boat, uh, the, the ark. Abraham, we looked at Abraham and Sarah. Abraham's one of the founders of the faith, right? 
God told Abraham to go to a distant land, pack up all your belongings and go to your distant land. In that message, uh, we kind of talked about some of you, that's your story, right? You, you ended up here in Florida. You don't know how you end up here, but you're like, you have Abraham's story. You packed up all your belongings because the Lord said, hey, it's time to move. It's time to go. Uh, there's, another, there's another opportunity. And so, uh, uh, but I'm not going to tell you all the de- details. You ever been there? I'm not going to tell you all the details. I'm going to see if you're going to be obedient and just follow my, my lead. And, and that's Abraham. His wife, Sarah, uh, his wife, Sarah, conceived at an old age. Uh, uh, any, any women uh, uh, rather conceive at an older age rather than a younger age? And, and, and when, when you don't have as much energy, right? And, and uh, anyways, this is Sarah, but she's holding on to the promise of God. Right? She's holding on to the promise of God. And it was by faith that she conceived at, uh, at this old, at an older, older age. And then we looked at Joseph and how Joseph remained Faithful, he lived a life of faith, and he remained faithful to the Lord uh, in the betrayal. Right, his brothers betrayed him; they threw him in a pit. Uh, he remained faithful, and then he was sold into slavery, and he remained faithful. And then he was thrown into prison, and he remained faithful. And and then he was in leadership, and once again remained faithful. He lived a life by by faith. And then Moses, Moses, could you imagine? Being Moses. They say, hey, you're growing up in this area. You're fleeing because of you killed somebody. And then you have a burning bush moment encounter with the Lord. And the Lord says, I want you to go back and lead some two million plus people out of bondage, out of slavery, out of oppression, out of Egypt. Stand up to Pharaoh, the, 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 the king o- o- over Egypt. I want you to do all of this. And and, and we do see that he asked some questions, but he did obey, right? And we can kind of relate in, in that setting, but, but he obeyed and he, he led these people out of, out of Egypt. And then last week we looked at Joshua. We looked at Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 starts with, with these words, Moses is now dead. And, and the baton has been handed to Joshua. And so Joshua is now called by God to lead the children uh, uh, of Israel into the promised land. And he does this by faith and under the leading of the Lord. He leads the children into the promised land. In Joshua chapter 1, as I said, Moses is dead and he prepares to lead the people into the promised land. Then then chapter 2, Joshua chapter 2, tells us that Joshua sent out two Two spies, we see it on the screens here. Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from the Acacia Grove saying, go and scout the land, especially Jericho. So they left, and they came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now that's the first place that we find uh, uh, Rahab, the prostitute. The first place we find her is right here. We read about her is here. And so these two spies, they, they go out, and last week, we, we kind of fast forward, right? And so we're going we're gonna to go, and then we're going to come back. Are you with me? You're going to say, all right, cool. Just want to make sure you're with me. And, and so last week, we kind of, we, we went fast forward to chapter 5 and 6, and what did we discover in chapter 5? Chapter 5, we discovered that Jericho is staring Joshua in the face. What's your challenge? What's your battle that's staring you in the face. You think about that just for a moment, your battle that's staring you. How, how can you win this, this battle? And so Jericho's staring him in the face. And, and, and so what does he do? The commander of the Lord's army shows up, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And what does he do? He looks up. He takes his eyes off of Jericho and he looks up. He takes his eyes off of Jericho and he looks up. We talked about uh, looking up, looking away from, from, from your Jericho, from your challenge, and, and, and looking looking up. And, and then we see that he bows down. He bows down. Scripture tells us in verse 14 that he bows down in reverence. You see the word reverence. He bows down in reverence. So he looks up and he bows down in the midst of a pending battle, right? We're all on the same page here. In the midst of a pending, pending battle, Jericho's staring him in the face. We read, Scripture tells us there's 40,000 men ready, ready to fight under his command. And they look over. Could you just imagine being one of those men looking over? And w- w- what's happening? There's Jericho, and what's going on right now? I mean, we're, we're ready to go to battle, man. We're ready to go to war. And, and what are you doing? You're looking up. Now you're bowing down. Hold on. Then you're taking off your shoes. We talked about if we're going to win the battle, we need to look up. We need to bow down. We need to take some time. We need to take some time. And the commander of the Lord's army said, hey, take off your sandals for the, where you're standing is what? 
holy ground. You're standing on holy ground. Commander of the Lord's army is saying, hey, take some time. Spend, spend some time with the Lord today. Most of us, we're just marching off into battle, saying, God, we'll call you when we need you. <laughs> Joshua takes time and is reminded that he needed the commander of the Lord's army to fight for him that day in that battle. And if we're going to win the battle, we need to take some time. And then we move forward in faith. And so chapter 6, Joshua chapter 6, we see that they, in fact, began to move forward and, and, and clearly obeyed the instructions of the Lord, which if any of us have any kind of military, uh, whether you have military experience or not, you think it's a crazy plan, right? The instructions were this, march around, the entire army march around the walls once a day for seven days. And on the seventh day, when the trumpets blow, shout in victory as if you've won the battle. I, can we just, honest moment, anybody be down for that? I, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but they did. They, they lived by faith. It was by faith. We looked at an example of the faith. They heard the instructions from the Lord, and it didn't quite make sense, but they obeyed the Lord, and they experienced a supernatural, supernatural moment in all of their lives that most would, would have shaped their lives for the, for the rest of their lives, right? I, I, did you, are, you, are you with me on that? And, and so, but it all started... That marching, that moment with the commander of the Lord's army, all that started with chapter 2 in Rahab. So before we come back to chapter 2, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. This is, this is our key verse for today. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. By faith, Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. By faith, Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. And, and so we, we know how the story ends, right? We know how the story ends. Any of you ever, ever want to know how the story ends before you get to the beginning? Well, now you know how the story ends. When we backtrack to chapter 2, Joshua sends out two spies to scout the land. And these two spies, they go to Jericho. And where do they stay? They stay in the home of a prostitute. They stay in the home of a prostitute. And her name is Rahab. Uh, why? First, why? I don't know if you, you're thinking, well, why would they go to a home of a prostitute? Well, they're, they're travelers, right? And they want to remain anonymous. They don't want anyone to know that they're there scouting out the city, scouting out the, the, the other army, scouting out the walls. I mean, they, they don't want anyone to know, so they're remaining anonymous. And uh, even the sovereignty of the Lord, though, we see the sovereignty of the Lord in this moment. Are you with me? We see the sovereignty of the Lord. So they go to this home of a prostitute named Rahab. The, the king gets word, somehow gets word that they're spies. And that the king calls for Rahab and, and she's hid the spies and they make this oath, they make this covenant. Now follow me, they make this covenant. And, and she acknowledges that the Lord that they worship and serve is the creator of all things. We see that in verse 14. Joshua 2, verse 14, we see that, that, that their God is the God uh, over all the, the earth, the one true and living God. And she begins to make this covenant with these two spies that, hey, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to hide you. I'm going to set you up to overtake this, this city. But when you come to destroy this city, would you save me and all my relatives? And so they made this covenant. And so they went back to Joshua. They went back to Joshua with this, with this covenant. And we see in Joshua chapter 6, verse 16, after the seventh time, the priests blew the trumpets, and Joshua said to the troops, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Verse 17, But the city and everything in it are set apart to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute, and everyone with her in the house will live because she hid the messengers we sent. Now, when the Bible tells the story, it makes no attempt to cover up her past. Do, do, do you see that? You read, you read the same thing I'm reading here. It makes no attempt. Five different times she's referred to as Rahab, the prostitute. 
We, we see that in James. We see that in Hebrews. And we see it three times in Joshua. Five times. Makes no attempt to cover up her, her, her past. She had a reputation that followed her until the day she died. And, and you know what's interesting? By including a woman in this Hebrews 11 text, by including a woman like this, I believe the, uh, the writer under the author, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants us to know that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Just think about that for a moment. I, I, just, I just went back. I know it's kind of all over the place, but just to, just to set us up to really understand the magnitude of this. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author wants us to know that Rahab the prostitute, that no matter your past, that's level ground at the foot of the cross. And so we see that Rahab was a prostitute. The fact that she was a prostitute, listen, magnifies the grace of God. It really does. It magnifies the grace of God by demonstrating that even the lowest of the low could find a place in God's family. And grace is for sinners. And only sinners need to be saved. Hear that today. Grace is for sinners and only sinners need to be saved. And so today, listen, don't miss this. Today, Rahab stands as an example of hope to the broken, hurting, bruised, fallen men and women everywhere who look in the mirror, who wake up each day looking in the mirror and saying, there is no hope for me. I don't know if that's you today. I don't know if that's your family member, that's your friend, that's your coworker. They get up every day and they say, there's no hope for me. And I want you to know today, don't miss this, that Rahab stands as an example. That yes, she was a prostitute. And at this very moment she is in heaven we see in this in the story the salvation is it's for the worst of sinners it's for the worst of sinners and note the past tense I, I said that she was a, a, a prostitute right she was a, a prostitute that that's what she was but but through the grace of God listen she became a woman of faith we're going to see that in just a moment through the grace of God she became a woman of faith. If God can save Rahab, he can save anyone. Hear that today. If God can save Rahab, he can save anyone. So, so we understand Rahab was a prostitute. Second thing we understand is Rahab was a Gentile. What does that mean? She, she was a Gentile. Rahab was a Gentile. That means she was a foreigner. That means she was a stranger. That means she was raised in a pagan religion. She wasn't raised in a family that worshipped the, the one true and, and living God. Uh, her family worshiped, would, have, would have worshipped other false gods. She did not belong to the Israelites. Yet by faith, she was accepted by God and by his, his people. And when the great attack on Jericho came, she and her family, they were, they were spared while the city around her was destroyed. Salvation for the worst sinners, but, but also salvation is, don't miss this, for all people. Man, it's for, it's for all people. Salvation is for all people. And this story teaches us that no one, don't miss this, man, that, that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. There's not one person in this place today there's not one person in all humanity that is beyond the reach of God's grace. And even in the midst of God's judgment, even in the midst of God's judgment, God reaches out and what does he do? He saves a prostitute who turns to him in faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Ephesians 2 verse 8. For you are saved by grace through faith. How are you saved? By grace through faith. It all starts with God. It all starts with God. It's all about His grace. You're, we're saved. We are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. That word gift, literally translated, means free gift of grace. Free gift of grace. 
You and I, if we're saved today, it's by God's grace. And I pray and I hope you are saved today. It's all because of God's grace. And there was a moment in your life that you surrendered over to Jesus and said, Jesus, there's no other way. I can't save myself. Only you can bring salvation. And so I surrender over to your lordship, that you are Lord of my life, that you are boss of my life. By grace through faith. We see it by God's grace through our, through our faith. And you think about the story of Rahab. You think about Rahab the prostitute. You think about all the men she, she had slept with. You think of all, all that sin. And you think of her stained reputation. You think of her past. And this is what God says. Listen, don't miss this, man. This is what God says. I know all about her past. She's forgiven. And it doesn't matter because she believed in me. It matters no more because she believed in, in, in me. And listen, not, not that sexual sin doesn't matter. I believe it matters greatly. I believe there's, uh, the choices have consequences. We all understand this. Choices ha- have consequences. And this reputation followed her for the rest of her, her life. Choices have consequences. But she is free now and forgiven. And in heaven, by faith, only unworthy people that are made worthy by the shed blood of Jesus and his grace go to heaven. There is no pit, listen, there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. There is no sin so terrible that Jesus cannot forgive it. And there is no stain on your soul that Jesus cannot wash away. And so what happened? After the city walls fell, the city was destroyed, what happened to, to Rahab? You wonder what happened to Rahab, the prostitute? Well, She married a Jewish man named Salmon. I don't make up the names. She she married a Jewish man. We see this from Matthew chapter 1. The the, the in-depth, beautiful genealogy. Matthew chapter 1. She she married a Jewish man named Salmon. And they had a son named Boaz. Boaz. You know what we find in the Old Testament book of Ruth? That Ruth, that Ruth and Boaz, they get married. And they have a son. You know what they named him? Obed. And Obed and another woman get married, and they have a son named Jesse. And Jesse and another woman get married, and guess what? They have a son named David, which is King David. And from that line, you, you follow it, Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 5 and 6, all the way down to verse 21, it points to our Savior, Jesus. That's what happened to Rahab. That's what happened to the story of Rahab. It's, it, it's a story of God's redemption. So no matter your past, this is the beauty of the gospel. This is what God can only do. He takes the, the deepest and darkest of sin, and he turns it into something beautiful. That's the whole point of the gospel. He saves us from the bondage which once held us captive, and he releases us. If we see that, the beauty of the gospel beauty of his salvation Rahab from her line came our savior Jesus been looking at text in Ephesians chapter 2 this past week I shared verse 8 we, but verse 4 I was reminded of it even this morning Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, I encourage you to write this down. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 reminds us, but God. Any scripture that starts with but God, man, it stands out. It jumps off the pages, man. But God is rich in mercy. We were once dead because of our trespasses and sin, but we are now made alive through the grace of our Savior, Jesus 
as I was thinking through this, this text, I was reminded of a story that, that happened this week. I, I picked up our girls from, from, uh, from school, and we're driving, right? We're driving, and uh, one of them look, looks over, and in the seat next to her, a pair of jumper cables, and she said, Daddy, what are these? What are these? And I said, well, they're jumper cables. And you know the next question, right? Anybody? Well, you know the next question. What do they do, right? <laughs> you know what's coming. What do they do? And I said, well, you put one side of it on a dead battery, and you put the other side on a good battery that's alive. And that good battery that's alive gives that dead battery life. Hey, I want you to know today, each person in this place, no matter your past, each person in this place, we were once dead, but in Christ we are now alive. We, we were dead in our trespasses and sin, and we needed, we needed a jump. And that jump brought salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's good news. That's good news. Those who are in dead are now made alive. Now, maybe you've been saved for a while, and you've forgotten what it's like to be dead. You've forgotten what it's like to be dead. I think one of the... the, the the worst thing that can happen in a church is to forget what it was like to be lost. Because here's what happens when we forget what it was like to be lost. It, 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 it turns into, it's all about me. It's all about me and my wants and my preferences because it's all about me. And we forget what it was like to be lost and doomed and damned to hell. And that apart from Christ, there is no freedom. We're just in bondage under our sin. We, we forget what it's like. And I pray that I'll never forget what it's like. I never want to come to the point where I forget what it's like and it turns into all about me. There are people all around us that are lost, that are dead, that are heading towards hell. And we have experienced life through the grace of God. By grace, through faith. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. If God can save Rahab, man, he can save anyone. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Some of us today, you, you spent far too much time allowing the enemy to run your life. Hey, friends, stop wasting this precious life. Release your past. Man, begin to move forward in faith. Find freedom in Christ Jesus today. Find freedom in Christ Jesus today. Don't waste another minute. How, Tim, how? And I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that Satan's going to just let up. No, he's going to keep coming after you. Because that's what he does, seeking whom he may devour. Like a thief. But here's how you do it. Lord, this day is your day. This day is your day. Use me today. Fix my eyes on you today. All the distractions from the enemy, push them away as I press in on loving you and knowing you. Finding, be reminded of freedom in Christ Jesus. Lord, this day, I'm covered by your grace. I'm not who I once was. I am a son and daughter of the Most High. Lord, 
this day, I humble myself before you and I move forward I move forward by faith I push all the noise all the naysayers all the critics I surrender them over to you because this day is for you and if you give me another that one's going to be for you. And if you give me another, that one's going to be for you. In all the days of my life, I live for an audience of one. I only listen to you. I only respond to you. Your word says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Your word says that you are with me, that you will not abandon me. You're going to come through, God, this day. Continue to respond to the Lord today. The band's going to begin singing these, these, these very simple words, and I don't want you to miss this moment. I don't want you to miss what the Lord wants to communicate to your heart today. No matter what you're walking through, even though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will what?